some of the most evocative and violent stories in this collection so far. We're talking about three pieces from Kane today. We're covering Conversion, Portrait in Georgia, and Blood Burning Moon by Gene Toomer today. Man, these hit hard, especially when putting them together as a trio. It's like the triumvirate one, two, three knockout. So the opening one, Conversion, it's not exactly hiding what it's about, right? It's called Conversion. We're talking about the African gods. We're talking about Christianity. I think it's really good to start off with this poem when reading these kind of in succession because it gives you a, a background of why maybe people in our country that were forced into slavery might feel the way they are, you know, having that resentment, not only because they were forced into servitude, but because their whole identity, culture, religion, everything was really not only stolen from them, but something new was pushed upon them. And this poem does a great job of kind of setting the feel, the mood for what's to come in the next poem and the story. It opens up with the African guardian of souls. Okay. And, and obviously I'm not an expert on this at all. But I get this idea, and it talks about being drunk with the rum and feasting on a strange cassava, right? So I, I don't know what the norm is. I don't know what the usual perception is, but we have these indulgent words describing them, plentiful words describing them. And then the middle part here, we have yielding to new words in a weak palabra, right? So we're, we're giving away to what's coming next, to your point. And I think that's very obvious that there is a historical background there about how the slaves had uh, Christianity pushed upon them. And what comes next? So the next thing happens is like they're forced upon into this religion and then it's the, the demons, right? Well, it says, of a white-faced sardonic god grins, cries, amen, shouts, hosanna. So you have some Christian words coming in there. Um, the white-faced sardonic god. A lot of times when we think about uh, gods, it's very common, you know, observation is that we anthropomorphize ourselves and our gods tend to look like us, right? Like, so it's the question of why do our gods look like us? So you have the Christian white-faced god coming in. And it's interesting the way that the, the poem just kind of talks about conversion, like the, the way the, the African god concedes and allows this to come in. But even the way Tumor paints these two gods, I don't know what the standard is for the African god, but I know a lot more about the Christian god. And to call him like sardonic and to say that he gr grins, cries, it, it, it makes me cause like a pause for a little bit to say like, why does Tumor create this world? where both exist. Like he, he's not painting it where one's right and wrong and the other's more correct and, and, and perfect. It's almost like both of these have these experience and it's almost like, I, I don't know what the point of view of this poem is, but it makes me feel, uh, it makes me think about those people that were being presented with two worldviews. And um, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm specifically calling back to the, the slavery time, but imagine being presented two worldviews here and having like these two gods coexist in a sense. Uh, imagine what that debate would look like about which one's correct or which one should you follow. It's kind of interesting. I wonder if Toomer had studied, obviously, some of the history of what happened to the slaves to know that this was so heavily forced upon them, but also if maybe he had researched and found out that a, a mass majority of Northern Africa, where a lot of the slaves that came to America or through different areas into um, you know America, eventually they were they were Muslims, they were Islam followers and that is is that something that's of contention here and then the slaves are sort of being forced into christianity and they're being told that they're lesser than because of what they look like and because of their culture and their religion and their language and that this other god and as you pointed out it's a white-faced god is superior to their god or gods because some of the um some of the tribes were still polytheistic but, but it, it is weird how does that matter? Does the forcing of it matter? Does the different colors matter? And I think that, that the painting of the picture here is just reminiscent of that this is not an option, um, that, that this is something that is being stolen from them and then something new pushed upon them, that this conversion is not willingly happening, I think, for the most part. You know, we're slowly learning about Tumor. We're slowly learning about Cain through this. I'd be, here, here's my next challenge is I think we should learn more about what was his relationship like with his parents? Because you have to remember, you said, did he study the history? 
Well, I mean, his parents were slaves. Yeah, I don't know all about the stuff of his religious upbringings and beliefs and systems, but being that his parents uh, were former slaves, that I think is still too new for reminiscent of when a lot of his ancestors would have been stolen from Africa. I mean, his parents weren't stolen from Africa and brought over as slaves in, you know, the 1800s. His great, 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 great grandparents were six generations, five generations back, and they might have been polytheistic, a different religion. They would have not spoken English as their primary language. They would have been, you know, is Islamic maybe. So it's those changes, I think, that the conversions that Toomer might be speaking of. It's not his parents. Yeah. His parents parents would have been Americans, you know, um, even though they're slaves, they spoke English as their primary language. They were probably raised as Christians. They spoke and ate and dressed just like Americans. Um, so I think that, I think the poem for me is speaking back to a time of when five generations ago, his ancestors were converted into Americans and what that may have looked like and felt like for them. You know, and let's move on to the next one, but I'll say the last piece is kind of like, I, I agree with you that uh, there's elements of that, and I, and I agree, but you have to remember that through these generations, they still kept a lot of their old-time uh, history and culture kind of secretive. It was still passed down to um, their children. It was it was sometimes hidden, and, and they outwardly faced and, and represented Christianity, but behind the scenes, they were still pushing a lot of their old culture and, and away from, from the past varying different degrees throughout throughout time that um I, I think there's a there's a richer story there than just like they got brought over and converted like i think it's a multi-generational trauma multi-generational story of, of how that kind of happened oh for sure real quick if you just look at their music that was something that was held on to so passionately if you look at um the the way that they um, and we can move into the next one is the hairstyle, right? And because that's basically one of the huge parts of this next poem is the way that they dressed and the, some of that still was held on to very, very fervently um, to not let go of everything of their previous culture. But again, some of it was forced upon them. They had to take Christian names. They had to go to church. These things they had to do, otherwise they were punished one way or the other. Uh, so... Yeah, it's uh, it's incredible how much history is there, and I would like to know more about Tumor of where he's drawing his inspiration from because these poems are very, very touching. Now, you started to talk transition us here into Portrait in Georgia, and that opening line, like the hair braided chestnut. If you just pause there, I think we can we can all appreciate the way that oh my gosh, Tumor describes aesthetics. He, he's just incredible. The best, the best right? The best. And, yeah. And what's interesting here too is I've had a friend. He so he is white and he's his wife is black, and they have mixed children. And one girl's hair is curly, and the other's hair is straight, right? And he he he's explained to me. He's like, no no no, you have to understand. Uh, this is very different. Like, a girl's hair is a beauty feature, but it is even different, more different in terms of how it is looked at within black culture. Right. So, so we start out with something that's very personal to, to women in general, but also black culture in terms of the, the hair, how does that look? And then just to instantly like this poem is maybe his most, it has the most amount of imagery. It maybe has the most amount of violence. It has the most amount of like emotion so far, I would say in these poems. Yeah. I feel like this, this poem is super important because it kind of bridges the gap of the three that we're putting together here. And it does it beautifully because it starts to invoke those emotions in you because you're painting a picture in your mind and there's all this violence to come. And those those words are charged, right? Red blisters, scent of cane. These are things that are getting into your eyeballs. These are things getting into your mouth, your nose. These are your senses that are you're maybe most aware of. And I, I love how this just like all combines together and, and making me feel almost uncomfortable. And I think that's where you're supposed to be. Yeah. So Blood Burning Moon has three parts, right? And to me, this is one of the more powerful pieces in, in Kane, like as a whole. We have basically three parts and three characters, right? We've got Louisa, whose skin resembles the color of young oak trees in fall. Again, Tumor just killing it with the descriptions. Just you, you can really just feel warmth. You can feel, I, I honestly, I'm sitting here reading it. I almost just feel this like 
energy like building up inside of me of like, I want to get to know Louisa almost like, like she just, she just has this, this je ne sais quoi about her that you want to get in your life almost. I felt like I did know her. I felt like I knew all of these characters. They're so well painted in such a short story. And again, coming off the imagery and the, the I'm charged, I'm ready for it of the two poems. I think going into this story, you already have an idea of what she's been through or what her family's been through. And then the way that she's described and the way that she is going through this horrific uh, journey with these other two characters, I feel like I do know Louisa. I really do. <laughs> so the story opens up with this talk about singing and the omen of the moon being kind of like a bad thing. And you have Louisa kind of singing her song as she's walking down the street and we have the, the moon upside. Kind of, kind of interesting, the, the slow rhythm of her song, to, to quote the piece. But she's contemplating these two men in the background, right? We got Bob, who is white, who is possessive, <laughs> who's got power. Awful. <laughs> and then we have Tom, who is, he's in the working fields, right? Like he's part of the lower class. He doesn't have the resources that, that Bob does. So she's contemplating these two. And if you're following along with Kane, you have a lot of these stories being pitting a light-skinned person between pure white and pure black, right? So, so that's nothing new. But here you almost have this pull between different types of love, I would say, too, if you call it love. Um, I, maybe that's not the right word. But you have the quote from the narrative. We have, his black balanced and pulled against the white of stone when we describe Tom, right? So we're clearly pitting Tom and Bob against each other. Fair? Oh, for sure. And I think that, I don't think that uh, love is a good way to describe it. In my opinion, I felt like it was just choices. Life gives you choices. And Louisa is saying, I can have this choice and have maybe this life with Bob, or maybe I could have this life with Tom. I know love isn't the right word, but remember when we did that uh, story, the what we talk about when we talk about love? And, and remember one of the oh, yeah. characters <laughs> making a point about her abusive relationship. She said, you know, she was abused, but she said, this is still love, right? He did love me. And I, I don't know if, if Bob really does love her, but, but he has that energy of like the possessive, like if I, if I own you, you are mine, right? And he loves possessions. Like it's, it's almost like, of a, a slavery view of love, like of ownership, a love of materialism and dehumanizing someone to become material is, is maybe the way I'm kind of struggling with, with how Bob views Louisa. I guess that comes back to the definition of, you know, what do you see as love? How do you love somebody? How do you reciprocate love? And for me, I guess just because Bob comes across so negatively and the way that he just views Louisa I don't see that as love, but I definitely could. Uh, there, there's an argument for that. Agreed. And I obviously don't either. Just clarify for viewers out there if this is the first video you've seen us discuss this. <laughs> so um, it ends with these little poems about coming out the factory door, the evil moon. And here we have all these animals making sounds, people singing, like again, like engaging my sight, engaging my sound, engaging all of my senses with, with Tumor's writings, honestly. And part two we move into Tom who honestly he he's a little violent right like when he's talking with these people and he pulls a knife out to protect like his honor almost in a sense what do you think of that i think that's where it comes back for me when i think about the choice that she's making of of bob or tom and maybe the way i took it is that tumor is saying that for her these two men are exactly the same the maybe only difference is their skin color to her uh, they are both violent men. They're both possessive men. Um, maybe Tumor is trying to write it as that this is how men behaved and this is the the bad choice or the bad choice that Louisa has to mm. make. <laughs> Not surprising you have the pessimistic human nature outlook on this. <laughs> yep, you know me. <laughs> That's All right, me. So let's put it this way. Tom does walk up to her. He sees her on the porch steps. He's got his hands in his pocket, almost like a child, right? And he's getting ready to walk off. Again, like a child, like afraid to confront, confront, I guess. And she almost, she stops him like, hey, come, yeah, Engage come, come with back her. here. Yeah. Like, and she starts talking to him. 
And he tells her about his dreams. So he's he's becoming vulnerable with her and opens up. And that's when we learn that he's got this plans for the farm. All he's got to do is just, uh-oh, he needs, he needs a gift from the white people, which is going to be a problem because he's vying for the girl that the white people need to give him the farm in order for him to kind of like realize his dreams. Yeah, this is the heartbreaking part of the story that you realize that this is how it was back then, that without the help of others, because many of the freed slaves in the South were, but but they were better off, don't get me wrong, uh, but they were still so tied to those former slave owners and the land because they had no other skills. And he has no resources. He has no resources. He has nothing but, I guess, his feelings and a dream and nothing to lose that makes him very dangerous and maybe that's why his violence is so um, apparent this section ends with a description of like these shadows and light hitting the wall and again when i think about lightness and darkness and the way that tumor is playing with with twilight through a lot of this here the the light and the dark can't coexist in the same way that these two men the 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 white and the black men are fighting over the same woman like they can't both win for Luisa's affection yeah, that's true. That's true. So that takes us to our last main character, which is going to be good old Terrible Bob. Terrible Bob, right? Heading out from his veranda. Like, <laughs> ooh, what a, what a bougie name. <laughs> and uh, he's thinking about <laughs> possession. Like, he's still, his mind is back in the slavery days, thinking that, that he can dehumanize someone and reduce them to a form of property. I own her. She belongs to me. And if there's, if she doesn't, then my family's lost ground, right? And the worst is he's not even thinking about her. Remember, he like starts to think about his family and he's just like, he starts to feel embarrassed when his family, what his family would think about the situation. Yeah, that's what is so puzzling to me is that he doesn't seem to genuinely like her. He's using her as, for a lack of better terms, what we would call almost like arm candy, Right. If I show that I control this, you know, person, that'll give me my power back that our family lost. So the it it she she's a she's a trophy is what she is to lord over in front of his family and over all the people that work on his farm. I wonder, you know, when we've read some of uh, Du Bois his writings, and we talk about how. In, in a perfect world where it's just these two, maybe Bob could come, maybe Bob could learn how to actually see her, right? Like, like he, I don't know, maybe we shouldn't even drop the L word anymore because he's just got to learn how to be a freaking human being at this point. Agreed. But I worry, like, Bob's the type of guy that when a, a white girl, like a higher, who owns more, higher class person in, in Jim Crow era point of time, that as soon as a, a white girl came along that was like a good match and he was interested in that color line, right? Like he, he's not going to cross that for Louisa. He's going to instantly jump back to his people, the white, the white folk, because he believes that's where power is. He believes that's where status is. His thought is they are the rightful rulers and the black people are meant to be servant to him. Yeah. And again, if this story is set in, you know, post reconstruction era, late 1800s, he is one generation removed from his parents being slave owners, or he might have been a little kid and there have been, you know, still slaves around him. So uh, he, he's he's not removed at all from that way of thinking. I, I'm surprised, honestly, that Toomer wrote it that Bob was progressive enough to be in a mixed relationship. Like, that's pretty incredible, too. Uh, to think that a Southerner would even entertain the idea of being in a legitimate relationship with somebody that is not the same race. That, that's pretty forward thinking. So quick, so now I'm the negative one. I had a much more negative view where I'm like, I, I totally viewed the whole thing as tenuous, that he would drop her in a second. Um, that it was just it, it was just for power. It wasn't even for her. It wasn't a relationship of two ways. It was one way of I own you was how I felt. Um, do you remember, okay, so in terms of plot, <laughs> the two men fight, right? And the, the white, the white guy was walking yep. around here to, uh, farmhands arguing over how, um, Bob or Tom is very dangerous. He's got the knife and they get, they end up getting in a fight. Do you remember who ends up, who, who actually starts the fight physically? Isn't it Bob starts it 
and then Tom oh, he finishes sure it <laughs> and stabs. Yeah, Tom stabs him, and then the posse gets rounded up, and then they hang him. So in the in the eyes of of perfect law, right? If the law were fair at this point in time, who committed the murder? Right. Well, technically, Tom did, but was it in self defense? Right. Technically, Bob did start the fight. There was a knife. There was a scramble, and you had witnesses. But the second that fight was over, and we saw that the the white guy was the one that got killed. What did all the people, who, all the witnesses, were they black or were they white? Oh, wasn't there mixed? Wasn't it both No, there? because he had to cross to, to, it was kind of like, I got the sense that the town was divided, that he had to cross over into the, the area where the working men were, the men that were working, oh, and the working men okay. were presumably black, and they all just, they ran into their houses because this is a power conversation now, right? The fact that a black man killed a white man is a completely different story in Jim Crow era than a white man killing a black man in, in terms of how the outcome unfolded, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, 1,000%. Yeah. Yeah, we, we know how this story unfolds very easily. Yeah, it happened way too many times, unfortunately. And, and did it go to the law? No, it came to vigilante justice. And what was vigilante justice? Again, it's a form of power by scaring people, by forcing people into their hands with no repercussions, without actual access to legal recourse and due process, you have power, right? And that's what happens is all the white people get together with their ropes and their shotguns. And again, a callback when we talk about the ropes from like the previous uh, Portrait in Georgia poem, right? These are, these are forms of control. These are forms of how the white community oppressed and, and did horrible things to previous uh, slaves to African Americans now at this point in time. Yeah, and I, I think I guess when I come to the end of the story, I, I I try to take all of this together as as one piece of we had the conversion. Okay, uh, we're trying to live like you. We're dressing like you. We're we're being like you. Um, we're we're trying to change our hairstyle to be the same, and we still can't get a, get a leg up. We're now free. And I still am subservient in some ways to, um, you know, the way that the life was in the South for, for Tom. And now he has to fight to even have a chance at somebody that uh, Bob really doesn't even want. And then he ultimately loses his life. Uh, and it just, it's so much violence and death for what? And I guess that's how I took of Tumor is to me was speaking to the fact of, does this really matter? Uh, does does the race, does color, should it matter? Um, it, because our cultures have become so blended together that is there a way to tell a difference anymore? Because Louisa, I mean, she was struggling with it. Could she tell a difference? She knew both men were violent, um, and she was looking at her choices of this. I don't know. And I feel like Tumor does a great job for me uh, to bring all of that together of what does race matter in America in his lifetime and in future lifetimes, because obviously, I, you know, we're reading this hundreds of years later that, uh, or a hundred years later, that that's trying to teach us a lesson. Two points there that you said in terms of like the tie back to conversion. Notice that Tom has a very Jesus-like death in terms of being burned at the stake, right? He's kind of like dying on his cross, wooden cross in a sense. And to your point about Louisa, we know who she chose, right? She didn't choose the white man because in the last part, she wonders... Where's Tom? Right. So we know that she ended up choosing uh, the man that saw her and that talked to her and didn't treat her like property. Ever the optimist. I knew you'd think this had a happy ending. She did love Tom. That's how I roll. That's how I roll. <laughs> Two men dead, Una. Two men dead. <laughs> but, but she had hope, and that's what matters to me. All right. Playlist down below for more Cane Talks. My name's yeah. been Una. <laughs> Peace.